Good afternoon, Aluminum. This is Davidson here. I am excited to read the next part of dun, 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 Harry Potter. Go back into the magical world of Harry Potter. Before we start, just quick recap of what we read yesterday. Um, Harry and Ron, so all of Gryffindor and Slytherin had their first flying lessons and Neville got in an accident and fell off of his broom and when he was taken off to the hospital wing, Draco Malfoy stole his remember all that he got from, that Neville got from his grandma and was wanting to kind of tease Neville and Harry went and got that from him. Harry was offered a position on the Gryffindor team and the Quidditch team and we have some conflict with Draco Malfoy and Harry Potter. So I wanted to really quick touch on what conflict is. We've talked about it a little bit, but it's been a while. So a conflict is any struggle, disagreement, or obstacle um, that's causing like tension or a problem. So conflict could also be like a problem. And we came up with a few conflicts, came upon a few conflicts, especially in this last chapter when we were reading with Harry and Draco, um, Hermione and Ron and Harry. Um, so I, I broke it down kind of to an equation. So a conflict is something that stands in the way of a character and their goals. So conflict here, I made it throwing in some math here. So we have a character, their want, and an obstacle. So adding these all together, the character, their want, their obstacle equals a conflict. So some of the wants were like Harry and Ron wanting to go sneak out to go to the wizard's duel, but Hermione was telling them not to and she was there and with them. So that was an obstacle in the way of Harry and Ron's wanting to go. So that caused a conflict. Um, if you can think of any other conflicts that we've read so far in the story or in the book, um, send a message and let me know so I can share it in the next one. But I'll pick up where we were last time. Okay. They're in here somewhere, they heard him mutter, probably hiding. This way. Harry mouthed to the others and petrified, they began to creep down a long gallery full of suits of armor. They could hear Filch getting nearer. Neville suddenly let out a frightened squeak and broke into a run. He tripped, grabbed Ron around the waist, and the pair of them toppled right into a suit of armor. The clanging and crashing were enough to wake the whole castle. Run, Harry yelled, and the four of them sprinted down the gallery. Not looking back to see whether Filch was following, they swung around the doorpost and galloped down one corridor, then another. Harry in the lead without any idea where they were going, or where they were or where they were going, they ripped through a tapestry and found themselves in a hidden passageway, hurtled along it and came out near their charms classroom, which they knew was miles from the trophy room. I think we've lost him, Harry panted, leaning against the cold wall and wiping his forehead. Neville was bent double, wheezing and sputtering. I told you, Hermione gasped, clutching at the stitch in her chest. I told you. We've got to get back to Gryffindor Tower, said Ron, quickly as possible. Side note for those following along in your own books, we're on page 159. Malfoy tricked you, Hermione said to Harry. You realize that, don't you? He was never going to meet you. Filch knew someone was going to be in the trophy room. Malfoy must have tipped him off. Harry thought she was probably right, but he wasn't going to tell her that. Let's go. It wasn't going to be that simple. They hadn't gone more than a dozen paces when a doorknob rattled and something came shooting out of the classroom in front of them. It was Peeves. He caught sight of them and gave a squeal of delight. Oh, stop it, Peeves. Please, you'll get us thrown out. Peeves cackled. Ha! Wandering around at midnight, ickle firsties. Tut, tut, tut. Naughty, naughty, you'll get caughty. Not if you don't give us away, Peeves, please. Should tell Finch I should, said Peeves in a saintly voice, but his eyes glittered wickedly. It's for your own good, you know. Get out of the way, snapped Ron, taking a swipe at Peeves. This was a big mistake. Students out of bed, Peeves bellowed. Students out of bed, down the charms corridor. 
Ducking under peeves, they ran for their lives right to the end of the corridor where they slammed into a door and it was locked. This is it, Ron moaned as they pushed helplessly at the door. We're done for. This is the end. They could hear footsteps, Filch running as fast as he could towards Peeves' shouts. Oh, move over, Hermione snarled. She grabbed Harry's wand, tapped the lock, and whispered, Alohomora. The lock clicked and the doors swung open. They piled through it, shut it quickly, and pressed their ears against it, listening. Which way did they go, Peeves? Filch was saying. Quick, tell me. Say please. Don't mess with me. Peeves, now where did they go? Shan't say nothing if you don't say please, said Peeves in his annoying sing-song voice. All right, please. Nothing. Ha, ha, ha. Told you I wouldn't say nothing if you didn't say please. Ha, ha, ha. And they heard the sound of Peeves whooshing away and Filch cursing in rage. He thinks this door's locked, Harry whispered. I think we'll be okay. Get off, Neville. For Neville had been tugging on the sleeve of Harry's bathrobe for the last minute. What? Harry turned around and saw quite clearly for what. For a moment, he was sure he'd walked into a nightmare. This was too much, on top of everything that had happened so far. They weren't in a room, as he had supposed. They were in a corridor, the forbidden corridor on the third floor, and now they knew why it was forbidden. They were looking straight into the eyes of a monstrous dog, a dog that filled the whole space between the ceiling and the floor. It had three heads, three pairs of rolling mad eyes, three noses, twitching and quivering in their direction, three drooling mouths, saliva hanging in slippery ropes from yellowish fangs. It was standing quite still, all six eyes staring at them, and Harry knew that the only reason they weren't already dead was that their sudden appearance had taken it by surprise, but it was quickly getting over that. There was no mistaking that those thunderous growls meant. Harry groped for the doorknob. Between filch and death, he'd take filch. They fell backward. Harry slammed the door shut and they ran, they almost flew, back down the corridor. Filch must have hurried off to look for them somewhere else because they didn't see, because they didn't see him anywhere, but they hardly cared. All they wanted to do was put as much space as possible between them and that monster. They didn't stop running until they reached the portrait of the fat lady on the seventh floor. Where on earth have you all been? She asked, looking at their bathrobes hanging off their shoulders and their flushed, sweaty faces. Never mind that. Pig snout, pig snout, panted Harry, and the portrait swung forward. They scrambled into the common room and collapsed, trembling into armchairs. It was a while before any of them said anything. Neville, indeed, looked as if he'd never speak again. What do you think they're doing keeping a thing like that locked up in the school, said Ron finally. If any dog needs exercise, that one does. Hermione had got both of her had got both her breath and her bad temper back again. You don't use your eyes, any of you, do you? she snapped. Didn't you see what it was standing on? The floor, Harry suggested. I wasn't looking at its feet. I was too busy with its heads. No, not the floor. It was standing on a trap door. It's obviously guarding something. She stood up glaring at them. I hope you're pleased with yourselves. We could all have been killed or worse, expelled. Now, if you don't mind, I'm going to bed. Ron stared after her, his mouth open. No, we don't mind, he said. You'd think we dragged her along, wouldn't you? But Hermione had given Harry something else to think about as he climbed back into bed. The dog was guarding something. What had Hagrid said? Gringotts was the safest was the safest place in the world for something you wanted to hide, except perhaps Hogwarts. It looked as though Harry had found out where the grubby little package from Vault Seven Hundred and Thirteen was. Chapter Ten. Halloween. Malfoy couldn't believe his eyes when he saw that Harry and Ron were still at Hogwarts the next day, looking tired but perfectly cheerful. Indeed, by the next morning, Harry and Ron thought that meeting the three-headed dog had been an excellent adventure and they were quite keen to have another one. 
In the meantime, Harry filled Ron in about the package that seemed to have been moved from Gringotts to Hogwarts, and they spent a lot of time wondering what could possibly need such heavy protection. It's either really valuable or really dangerous, said Ron. Or both, said Harry. But as all but as all they knew for sure about the mysterious object was that it was about two inches long. They didn't have much chance of guessing what it was without further clues. Neither Neville nor Hermione showed the slightest interest in what lay beneath the dog and the trapdoor. All Neville cared about was never going near that dog again. Hermione was now refusing to speak to Harry and Ron, but she was such a bossy know-it-all that they saw this as an added bonus. All they really wanted now was a way of getting back at Malfoy and all, and to their great delight, just such a thing arrived in the mail about a week later. As the owls flooded into the great hall, as usual, everyone's attention was caught by one, at once, by a long, thin package carried by six large screech owls. Harry was just as interested as everyone else to see what was in the large parcel and was amazed when the owl soared down and dropped it right in front of him, knocking his bacon to the floor. They had hardly fluttered out of the way when another owl dropped a letter on top of the parcel. Harry ripped open the letter first, which was lucky because it said, Do not open the parcel at the table. It contains your new Nimbus 2000 but I don't want everybody knowing you've got a broomstick or they'll all want one. Oliver Wood will meet you tonight on the Quidditch field at seven o'clock for your first training session. Professor M. McGonagall. Harry had difficulty hiding his glee as he handed the note to Ron to read. A Nimbus 2000, Ron moaned enviously. I've never even touched one. They left the hall quickly, wanting to unwrap the broomstick in private before their first class. But before their first class, but halfway across the entrance hall, they found the way upstairs barred by Crab and Goyle. Malfoy seized the package from Harry and felt it. "That's a broomstick," he said, throwing it back to Harry with a mixture of jealousy and spite on his face. "You'll be in for it this time, Potter. First years aren't allowed on them." Ron couldn't resist. It's not any old broomstick, he said. It's a Nimbus 2000. What did you say you've got at home, Malfoy? A Comet 260? Ron grinned at Harry. Comets look flashy, but they're not in the same league as the Nimbus. What would you know about it, Weasley? You couldn't afford half of the handle, Malfoy snapped back. I suppose you and your brothers have to save up twig by twig. Before Ron could answer, Professor Flitwick appeared at Malfoy's elbow. Not arguing, I hope, boys, he squeaked. Potter's has been sent a broomstick, Professor, said Malfoy quickly. Yes, yes, that's right, said Professor Flitwick, beaming at Harry. Professor McGonagall told me all about the special circumstances, Potter. And what model is it? A Nimbus 2000, sir, said Harry, fighting not to laugh at the look of horror on Malfoy's face. And it's really thanks to Malfoy here that I've got it, he added. Harry and Ron headed upstairs, smothering their laughter at Malfoy's obvious rage and confusion. Well, it's true, Harry chortled as they reached the top of the marble staircase. If he hadn't stolen Neville's Remembrall, I wouldn't be on the team. So, I suppose you think that's a reward for breaking the rules? Came an angry voice from just behind them. Hermione was stomping up the stairs, looking disapprovingly at the package in Harry's hand. I thought you weren't speaking to us, said Harry. Yes, don't stop now, said Ron. It's doing us so much good. Hermione marched away with her nose in the air. Harry had a lot of trouble keeping his mind on his lessons that day. He kept wandering up to the dormitory where his new broomstick was lying under his bed or straying off to the Quidditch field where he'd be learning to play that night. He bolted his he bolted his dinner that evening without noticing that he was eating and then rushed upstairs with Ron to unwrap the Nimbus 2000 at last. Wow, Ron sighed as the broomstick rolled into Harry's bedspread. Even Harry, who knew nothing about the different brooms, thought it looked wonderful. 
sleek and shiny with the mahogany handle. It had a long tail of neat straight twigs and Nimbus 2000 written in gold near the top. At, as seven o'clock drew nearer, Harry left the castle and set off in the dusk towards the Quidditch field. He'd never been inside the stadium before. Hundreds of seats were raised in stands. Oh, excuse me. Hundreds of seats were raised in stands about the field so that the spectators were high enough to see what was going on. At either end of the field, there were three golden poles with hoops on the end. They reminded Harry of the little plastic sticks muggle children blew bubbles through, except that they were 50 feet high. Too eager to fly again to wait for wood, Harry mounted his broomstick and kicked off the ground. What a feeling. He swooped in and out of the goalposts and then sped up and down the field. The Nimbus 2000 turned wherever he wanted in the lightest touch. Hey, Potter, come down. Oliver Wood had arrived. He was carrying a large wooden crate under his arm. Harry landed next to him. Very nice, said Wood, his eyes glinting. I see what McGonagall meant. You really are a natural. I'm just going to teach you the rules this evening. Then you'll be joining team practice three times a week. He opened the crate. Inside were four different sized balls. Right, said Wood. Now, Quidditch is easy enough to understand, even if it's not too easy to play. There are seven players on each side. Three of them are called chasers. Three chasers, Harry repeated as Wood took out a bright red ball about the size of a soccer ball. This ball is called a quaffle, said Wood. The chasers throw the quaffle to each other and try to get it through one of the hoops to score a goal. Ten points every time the quaffle goes through one of the hoops. You follow me? The chasers throw the quaffle and put it through the hoops to score, Harry recited. So that's sort of like basketball on broomsticks with six, ho six hoops, isn't it? What's basketball? said Wood curiously. Uh, never mind. Harry said quickly. Now there. Now, there's another player on each side who's called the keeper. I'm the keeper for Gryffindor. I have to fly around our hoops and stop the other teams from scoring. Three chasers, one keeper, said Harry, who was determined to remember it all. And they play with the quaffle. Okay, got that. So what are they for? He pointed at the three balls left. So what are they for? He pointed at the three balls left inside the box. I'll show you now, said Wood. Take this. He handed Harry a small club, a bit like a short baseball bat. I'm going to show you what the bludgers do, Wood said. These two are the bludgers. He showed Harry two identical balls, jet black and slightly smaller than the red quaffle. Harry noticed that they seemed to be straining to escape the straps holding them inside the box. Stand back, Wood warned Harry. He bent down and freed one of the bludgers. At once, the black ball rose high in the air and then pelted straight at Harry's face. Harry swung at it with the bat to stop it from breaking his nose and sent it zigzagging away into the air. It zoomed around their heads and then shot at Wood, who dived on top of it and managed to pin it to the ground. See, Wood panted, forcing the struggling bludger back into the crate and strapping it down safely. The bludgers rocket, the bludgers rocket around, trying to knock players off their brooms. That's why you have two beaters on each of the team. The Weasley twins are ours. It's their job to protect their side from the bludgers and try to knock them toward the other team. So, think you got all that? Three chasers try and score with a quaffle. The keeper guards the goalposts. The beaters keep the bludgers away from their team. Harry reeled off. Very good, said Wood. Uh. Have the bludgers ever killed anyone? Harry asked, hoping he sounded offhand. Never at Hogwarts. We've had a couple of broken jaws, but nothing worse than that. Now, the last member of the team is the Seeker. That's you. And you don't have to worry about the Quaffle or the bludgers. Unless they crack my head open. Don't worry, the Weasleys are more than a match for the bludgers. I mean, they're like a pair of human bludgers themselves. Wood reached into the crate and took out the fourth and last ball. Compared with the quaffle and the bludgers, it was tiny, about the size of a large walnut. It was bright gold and had little fluttering wings. All right, tomorrow we'll read about what 
fall, Harry will try to get as the seeker. Until next time!